Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kat Eddy, and I'm chair of the Board of Education. I would like to begin this evening's meeting by acknowledging that this meeting is taking place on the traditional territories of the Lakota people. Please note that there is a short production delay between the live event you are viewing and the meeting participants. The question and answer function is open for questions on agenda items throughout this virtual meeting. A final call for questions will be made after the last agenda item and the questions will be addressed before the end of the session. I would like to call this meeting to order at 7.32 on November 15th, 2022 and begin with my chairperson's remarks. This past Friday, I had the honour of attending the Remembrance Day ceremonies in downtown Campbell River. This was the first significant public gathering I've attended since the beginning of the pandemic. The mood was fittingly respectful and somber. Glancing around the large crowd, I saw a great representation of the whole of Campbell River. From babes in parents' arms to elders leaning on canes. It was wonderful to see and share smiles with people I had missed for too long. It felt normal and felt like a corner had been turned. It felt like community. The pandemic has done much to separate us, but it has also done much to demonstrate how a community can be the greatest safety net when events beyond our control happen. Each of our schools is its own community and each has its own identity. They are places where every child, every day can be seen and can experience the warmth of a community member's smile. Schools allow children to feel safe enough to be their normal selves and facilitate access to a network of safe, caring adults should they need them. It is these communities that we in education strive to create for every child. Our end goal in education, I feel, should be to launch from our buildings and programs, connected, engaged youth with the skills and confidence to carry them forward in building their own communities. Last Friday, when observing a moment of silence for those who sacrificed, I thought these very things. The freedom to participate in community, the knowledge that neighbours known or unknown will be there to help, and that every child who passes through our education system will be given equitable opportunity, are what the men and women before us fought for. And the continuation of that work is what we are tasked with as leaders and educators. This is front of mind at our first public business meeting of the 2022-2026 Board of Education and in my first address as board chair. I reflect on this freedom and responsibility we have been granted and the solemnity of our purpose. The capacity to create equitable education communities in each of our public schools is key to supporting the learning needs of every child. It is in this vein that I am pleased to announce the beginning of the consultation and information gathering process as we move forward into the development of the strategic plan for the 2023-2028 period. And I look forward to this process with great anticipation and trust that, that we'll do our best to, uh, to get it right for our kids. Thank you. So moving forward to the superintendent's remarks, I just wish to note that um, that Dr. Morrow is unable to attend this evening due to health matters, and we are looking to Associate Superintendent Sismic for the superintendent's remarks this evening. Well, thank you, Chairperson Eddie. Uh, superintendent Morrow sends his regrets and wishes he could be here. Uh, you spoke about uh, attending the November 11th, November 11th ceremonies, and it's a day uh, for us to solemnly remember our veterans. The School Act has a provision that the day before Remembrance Day, uh, schools celebrate through an assembly uh, those same veterans. And, and this year was no different. We had student participation in the form of poems and stories, uh, choir singing. Uh, it was an opportunity to share and keep the spirit of Remembrance Day alive in our schools and, and even more Profound. It was an opportunity for parents to come and see that in our schools. Another opportunity uh, in the post COVID era for, for schools to resume to that normalcy and, and such an important thing for our students to be part of. Coming up uh, for our elementary and our middle school families, we're going to have a learning update that will be going home. It's a written update in the areas of 
literacy, numeracy, and learning behaviors. And shortly after that, we're going to have our first student-led conference of the year. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Associate Superintendent Sisnik. Moving on to approval of the minutes of October 11th, 2022. I do have a motion here. I just want to note for the new uh, board members that this will be required to be moved and seconded by um, returning board members as you weren't able to attend that meeting. <laughs> so the approval of the minutes of the meeting of October 11th, 2022 um, are hereby approved as circulated. May I have a mover? Trustee Hagan, seconded by Trustee McMahon. All those in favor? And so moved. And on to 3B, um, approval of the meeting minutes of November 1st, 2022. And the motion reads that the minutes of the meeting of November 1st, 2022 are hereby approved as circulated. Moved <laughs> by Trustee Hagan, seconded by Trustee Gladish. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Awesome. So moving forward to the floor, is there any business arising from the minutes? Seeing none, um, are there any additions or alterations to the agenda? Uh, Trustee Hagan? I have one under uh, elected and board matters, please. Okay. I guess it would be item number D. Okay. And could we have some description? It's under um, uh, public health officer. I think that should be enough. Public health officer. Mm -hmm. OK. And Trustee Briggs. I'd like to add French immersion. OK. And shall we put that under educational submissions? Sure. The educational issues 13A. 13A, OK. Mm -hmm. Your educational issue, 13A. Okay. Excellent. Is there any other additions or alterations to the agenda? Seeing none, the motion reads that the agenda agenda is hereby approved as amended. May I have a mover? Trustee Briggs, seconded by Trustee Hagan. All those in favor? So moved. My agenda here. So on to um, number seven, which is the report of the board decisions from the November 15th confidential board meeting. Uh, Vice Chair Phyllis. Yep, we attended to matters in accordance with School Act 72, Section 3, pertaining to labor. Thank you. Moving on to eight correspondence in your packages, you will see a, um, a letter from Minister Jennifer Whiteside in response to letters drafted by the previous board regarding exempt compensation. In the letter, uh, Minister Whiteside um, shares that she has forwarded this letter on to PSEC and to BCPC. Trustee Hagan? I'm glad that we've been so persistent with this letter going back and forth a couple of times and that we're actually getting a response. It could be because the contracts, you know, being uh, negotiated and hasn't necessarily come to approval yet, but it seems like they're moved, moving forwards in lots of areas and it would be nice to uh, see some equity in this particular area. And it looks like she's pushed it, pushed it forward with some resolve to the uh, rightful uh, people. So I'm really pleased to see we actually got a response and it seemed to be a positive response. So thank you for your comments, Trustee Hagan. Agreed. Um, so on to 9A, there, I see that there's no public submissions or no agenda submissions. So I'd like to move forward on to 11 educational submissions, and I'd like to um, welcome Brenna Ewing forward to speak to us regarding the Student and Family Affordability Fund. Thank you, Brenna. Good evening, Honorable Trustees. Um, my name is Brenna Ewing. I'm the Director of Learning Support Services here for the district. Uh, 
<laughs> Thanks for your patience. So I am here to present on the Student and Family Affordability Fund and um, my colleague Deborah Martel, District Principal of Indigenous Education and English Language Learners was going to be here with me tonight, but she sends her regrets. She also is just not feeling well. So I will present on both of our behalfs and on behalf of the senior management team. Now we can use our computer. Um, so um, as most of you probably know, the Minister of Education and Child Care, Jennifer Whiteside, announced the Student and Family Affordably, Affordability Fund late in August. So this was a $60 million provincial fund intended to support students and families who are struggling uh, with rising costs due to global inflation. Um, what that looked like for our district was an allocation of $607,563 on a one-time basis that has to be spent within the 2022-23 school year. So, um, there, these are basically the criteria or requirements, um, which included consultation with our in Indigenous Education Advisory Council to determine any unique needs for our Indigenous learners, uh, district parent advisory councils, and communities with unique equity needs to ensure the needs of all diverse populations are met. Um, the funds need to be used in as flexible, private, and stigma-free manner as possible. And here are the spending descriptors, spending on food security, um, students and families, in addition to any planned or budgeted spending on food and meal programs and spending that provides family assistance by way of offsetting costs for such things as school supplies, education related fees, clothing, footwear required for school sports and other school activities, etc. Um, so one of the pieces was that this funding had to support on top of like an extension of what we already do. So I think each year we do get community links funding, and this is just like a bit of a snapshot of what is already supported through that funding in different ways. So currently in our district, we support breakfast programs, snack lunch programs, clothing, transportation, uh, which could be in bus passes or helping families um, in different way if they have uh, barriers due to transportation issues. Uh, our summer reading program is supported by community links, uh, our youth care worker support, um, some sometimes prescription medication, prescription eyewear, field trip costs, and that's just um, some of the pieces that are used by the community links each year. So this plan had to be on top of those supports that are already in place. Um, so our stakeholder consultation, um, our district, as you know, is compri comprised of a diverse demographic, and so we did need to seek um, understanding um, from all the various groups, including but not limited to our Indigenous Advisory Council, parents, guardians, our principals and vice principals, as well as external community partners. Um, as directed by the ministry, we engaged in consultation with these partner groups in the development of our action plan. So what that looked like was um, consultation was um, meetings, feedback solicited, uh, um, and then kind of revisited, feedback again, solicited to help us come up with this plan. Um, and the input from our stakeholders directly informed the guiding principles and subsequent action steps that will um, the plan for our funding. So here are our guiding principles. Um, we need to ensure that the funding is in used in accordance with the Ministry of Education and Child Care guidelines. Like I said, it has to be in as flexible, private and stigma free manner as possible. Um, creatively use the funding so we can have the most impact. Um, develop a multi pronged approach so that we are going to support like schools, a school based level, district level and through community partnerships. Uh, we have to have ongoing consultation through this process and 
um, will ensure the action plan is organic and flexible and can be adapted to meet changing needs and overcome unanticipated barriers that may emerge. Um, so we are, um, this is our multi-tiered approach to uh, the funding. Um, so it's broken down here into those three levels. Tier one is the district-based initiatives. So these initiatives will be organized and implemented at the district level in consultation with district partners and include um, selected school supply relief at the elementary, middle and secondary school level, expansion and development of existing and new school food programs, as well as expansion and development of partnerships with third party community partners. So that's kind of that like um, access accessibility for all who need this funding. Tier two is those school based initiatives. So these will be um, implemented, organized and implemented at the school level. So these are going in consultation with local school partners. So schools will be um, consulting with their um, families, PACs, other stakeholders within their community to develop the plans that are specific to those school contexts. Because some of the feedback we heard was that there are district pieces we have to do, but then as we know, our schools have um, their own context of things that they need to support um, their vulnerable learners. Um, so these will focus on additional efforts to address food security, school supply costs, school fee relief, um, access to clothing and equipment required for meaningful participation in school based programs and activities. And schools will be um, filling out sort of a grant application or a plan for those funding that, like we said, will be in consultation with their school partners and then will come to the district level for that um, approval. And then the tier three is um, initiatives that are going to be implemented and organized at a district level, but it's sort of a bit of an emergency fund. So it's um, in consultation with our uh, learning support services and indigenous education um, department, in particular school counselors and youth care workers. Uh, we will be looking at additional efforts for some of our families um, to address food security, school supplies, additional fee relief access to clothing and equipment required for meaningful participation. Again, in school based programs, but that might be information that comes from um, specialized services that work with families and they might need um, some of that um, relief. So what that looks like, I'll just go through these um, and go through them quickly is about 75,000 um, of the fund is going to go into that tier one, which looks like this at elementary, middle and secondary school, basic school supply fees, um, fee relief, like at middle and secondary, it might be for like if you're taking a woodworking class or if you're in um, an outdoor education class and maybe there's a fee with that and that could be supplemented. Um, so that's about 75,000. Um, <laughs> as well as um, about 200,000 that's going to go to our um, use to address food security. So some of these programs are already in place in our district and will be expanded. Um, and then some are in the works of working with community partners. So um, like Backpack Buddies is we're very fortunate that we get a grant and but we're going to um, enhance that um, uh, for families with su supplementing the food items um, and as well as we're just working on this um, a pilot program that we will be working with the Campbell River Emergency Food Planning Committee and looking at how um, that organization is going to support some of the food security issues, supplementing some of our other programs. As uh, school based allocations, this is the piece I talked about that will be um, individual school sites and that's um, 300,000 and that will be broken up um, into our um, individual school sites, but they'll create a plan and um, submit that to the district, which still has to be in line with the criteria. And then I already spoke to this one, but that will be about 30,000 for those specialized circumstances that we might need to utilize as well. So that's just the overall breakdown to see it all together there. So 75,300 and then a bit of the 
food program um, 30,000, and then the food program just broken down a little bit more into the categories. And then just our implementation timeline. So we had our consultation and action fund, the action fund stakeholders, which you believe yourself. Um, implementation. Some of the pieces are already in the works, like schools are being, um, um, the money is being transferred for like school supplies and those kind of things already to offset the cost. So some of it's already happening. And then of course we're going to monitor, adapt, and report. We have to do one report um, midway in the year, January, and then we'll continue to monitor and check in. Again, the funds have to be spent this year, so we will be monitoring to ensure that um, we're utilizing the funds. And then at the end, we have to do the report to the ministry and stakeholders. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank yeah. For that uh, for that presentation, I'm, I am going to field some questions from trustees, and I'll start with Trustee Higgin. I have three, if that's okay. When you say you uh, send it back to the district for approval, who who does that represent then? Like, oh, sorry, that will be the senior management team. Okay. So there'll be the their specific criteria. We have kind of a piece that they'll work through with their um, schools. I could have brought that. I didn't. I thought I might mention how exciting it is that we have money for those most at need. Yeah, it's exciting. You know what, often we, I'm really excited that the government has done this because uh, we really do have a need in some of these areas and we don't have the funding to often provide everything. So that leads me to my last question, which is, is this a one off? Or is this, I, I hate people to get used to something mm -hmm. and then we have to withdraw that funding. So maybe this is more for you. Uh, do you know if this is a one off or is it going to be uh, something that's ongoing every year? Uh, so this is definitely one off and that has been a big part of the conversation about the items that are being supported. <laughs> However, this has uh, been provided uh, on behalf of the government and we've it's a targeted fund. So anything that's unspent here will be isolated and identified. We ha don't have any instructions yet on what to do with unspent into next year, but it'll likely be uh, spent on the same or similar items. But obviously we hope that most of it gets spent this year and there'll be much <laughs> less uh, available. But so a few items might be able to continue on into next year, but we do not expect to get this again. I, I guess my question was more along the idea of uh, families and uh, those that need, most that need, uh, getting support this year and coming to expect that maybe we can resolve a multitude of issues and then all of a sudden that funding just drops right off. So I get, are our people being advised as they're given money this year that it, it, this is a, maybe a one time? I mean, that is the information uh, that is being put out. I think that's one of the things uh, like in carefully planning and like, <laughs> jumping forward with the plan is that's one of the pieces for families is we want to support, but we don't want to create something that people are dependent on. And then when it's taken away, they're in maybe like, you know, a, a difficult situation. So we have tried to think of ways that we could supplement and even some of the partnerships are piloted because if they're successful, then we're hoping that we can maybe access other grants and things to maybe continue some of them. So that's why we, yeah, so we, we that's part of our planning process is to think about how might we be able to continue. Yeah. Thank you, Tristy Higgin. Kevin, do you have a? Is there anybody else? Oh, uh, yeah, Tristy McMahon. Um, yes, on the last slide that had the timeline, did you say where on that timeline we are? We, are, we were basically in the presenting to stakeholders, the plan, and then we have done some initial implementation, like some of the funds mm -hmm. have, have been um, reimbursed back to schools, um, and some of the planning pieces are in place. So it's kind of partially started at the same time. We're just rolling out the entirety of the plan because, I mean, obviously at the beginning of the year, we're trying to offset those costs. That's the point of it, but at the same time, you know, the at the end of August to come up with a comprehensive plan. So we're kind of trying to work work with both. Give well, and I expect fun. some pieces will be rolled out at a different rate than other pieces. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And there might be enough that other emergent funds is maybe something arises that we have to, we have that pocket of money for and then 
like Mr. Patrick said, um, it might be at the end of the year. Like if that fund isn't spent, we have to look at like, does it roll over or um, what? How could we spend that in a different way? We don't want to give any back. <laughs> yes. Uh, trustee, Trustee Gillis. Yeah, first of all, great presentation. So good to know that there are dollars coming to support our most vulnerable. Um, from a larger community perspective, I've often wondered, is there a way of us knowing who's receiving what kind of support? Um, I'm speaking from kind of a, a, an active a volunteer role that a lot of time get grant submissions or they get requests and there isn't ever really a knowledge of does this school or that school have already have a breakfast program or a lunch program is in need. And so I just wondered if there's any place where we could source that kind of information as a uh, community. Well, I think that's one of the pieces that's highlighted in getting more funds is for us mm -hmm. to um, maybe garner a little more information really specifically about what's happening in our schools because yeah. it's sitting on like the, the um, emergency food table is like they're saying like you know working together we might be able to support the district more if we knew like what sure. your needs were so this has highlighted that I think which some more work needs to be done so my answer is That's potentially down the road but but not right now yeah sure. and I think the grant the information from schools when they're applying for their um, specific context will help us with that information too. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Uh, yeah, so I would just like to commend the work that Brenna and Deb Martell have done on this because heading into this school year, after their year work plans had already been set, this was brought upon um, school districts. Uh, and it started out with a bit of a mess where some families last year had already paid for their fees up front and some hadn't, and some families were showing up wondering whether they should or shouldn't and uh, be paying for fees. And so kind of getting into it in the middle of that mess, they put together a plan, um, started talking to stakeholders um, and were able to uh, fairly quickly put this plan together. Um, I've heard situations around the province where some have not done as thorough of an engagement. Uh, and some schools are sitting on more money than they feel they can adequately spend, which means that it won't be spent effectively or efficiently. Uh, this plan here um, is is a, is a great plan with a lot of work put in it that will touch on a lot of different things and supports a lot of people in the community. So great job. Well, thank you. It was a collaborative process. And I, I should also point out um, it's so lovely to have um, colleagues because um, we were at a conference where districts sort of shared in their plans and we were able to um, get ideas from other districts and um, one of the ideas was presented from the, the soup district and so that helped us um, with our plan too so it's um yeah that's the great piece of being able to collaborate with other people <laughs> sorry brenda you're not off the hot seat quite yet okay. uh trustee Hagen followed by trustee glad yes i know it's fairly complicated when you have pilot programs and then you're applying for for grants uh, do we have an active um, group that look for grants in various areas or is it just kind of one off or? I would say at this stage it's a one off. We don't have anyone in particular assigned to that in our district, but there are different um, at different school sites depending like there's um, some schools that have are heavily involved in writing grants for their garden programs or um, you know, we just received like <coughs> Morgan Health probably spoke to a, a one of these, but a grant to support our French programs, or we also have the grant that currently is supporting um, our physical literacy coordinator. So they're happening, but yeah, it's it's probably off the off the side of desk. It still ha still happens. There's not someone specifically assigned to it. To um, mm -hmm. Glass. Um you said that this is over and above the current supports that are available. I'm just wondering how great is the need according to what you've um, you know, received so far in terms of application in uh, schools or with individuals? Um, so what I, I would, yeah, I, I don't know the most current statistics around how many of our students live in poverty. I think it's in the 27 to to 30% range, like across our 
<clears throat> across our city. So that would be similar in our schools. Of course, some of our school sites, um, you know, it just depends. Some have a higher um, vulnerability index and fam more families that need support and some don't. So the other piece is that at little people piece and trying to make sure we're um, hitting the targeted audience, right? That was a big piece of the plan too. Like, you know, like some districts were like, let's just give $50 to every student or I was like, how do you ensure that you're, you know, putting the money where it's supposed to be? So, um, yeah, we do have like a, I mean, our, the ministry does create like a vulnerability index for our schools, which is partly how we figure out um, sometimes how to equitably distribute the, the funds. Yeah. Right. And, and just leading up, uh, another leading question is, um, I guess it would be really important to monitor it really carefully mm -hmm. so that, you know, if, if all that money is used up this year, you know, there's obviously a need that yeah. isn't being filled that we might need to be, mm -hmm. you know, uh, find creative ways to uh, fill that need next year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's see next call. Um, uh, another thought occurs to me in that we appear to be in something of a new circumstance in that we've we've had some notion of who those most vulnerable families were in our community and our school communities but there seems to be a new emerging vulnerability in that i am encountering families who have been doing okay and now are not doing so okay because of you know mortgage rates going up rents going up food costs going up gas going up so people who were managing are now managing less well. And so how do you identify those? Because there have been some indicators that have allowed us to identify families who are traditionally considered somewhat vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And now we have this whole new kind of state of vulnerability. How do you identify those folks? And I, you wanna to speak to that? I, and I think from my experience in the school setting, a lot of it comes from the relationship from the classroom teachers with the families. They know uh, when, when those relationships are built, parents are honest about mm -hmm. kind of the struggles that they may experience. And so that's our best source of data is, is the classroom teachers know uh, what many or most of the kids in the classroom are going through and, and the families open up to those classroom teachers. And so we have a hotline to those teachers so that we can <laughs> make sure we are on to those. Yeah, and I think this the stigma free piece of this is the way families will access funds. There, there's not going to be questions asked so that you don't have to come forward or be in a position where you're identifying yourself. We're not going to ask if, if you feel that you need that support for your child then then you know there's it's that's the stigma free part. You, you never know who is in a position for whatever life circumstances throws at you that they might be needing support. So yeah. I'd like to Christine again. I'm sorry. It, what a wonderful report. And I'm so thankful for the money that was given to us. And I'm hoping that we can somehow create a plan so that we're looking forward to the future because I do see a lot more homeless people. Uh, I do see a lot more uh, people in stress. Uh, I go downtown now and it's changed since in the, even in the last five, 10 years. And um, in any way that we can support the children in our classrooms, uh, I think whatever we start now, we should be looking forward to the future that we can continue our support because I think this is where we need to go in the next while. And I don't know what that would look like, but it would be nice to, to bring this into what we do. And it becomes regular and the funding becomes stable and that we apply now for next year and say thank you for what you gave us but can you do this in the future and and what is there that we can look forward to because these people really do need our help and and my heart just goes out to them and uh, anyways thank yeah. you for your good work yeah it would be lovely if you know in the future every single one of our schools had a lunch program that was just part of going to school every day, right? And no, and Absolutely. nobody had to, to pay for it or ask for it. That would be yeah. my ultimate dream. <laughs> but um, yeah, in the meantime, this is a great way to off offset some of that. Yep. And like you said, find out, um, this will help us determine what, um, 
what we need to do in the future based on how it's spent. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Brenna. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the ministry for that top up um, and also continue to acknowledge the ministry for the community links fund that I know is used so heavily by all of our schools across the district and has for many years. So I'd like to also uh, acknowledge the ministry for that continued funding moving forward to help families outside of a one time threat. So looking down our agenda, we are now at electorate and board matters. And at this point, I'd like to hand the gavel, which actually I have right here, over to Vice Chairperson Gillis for the election of the um, BCPC and the BCSTA Provincial Council. We can do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, approval of all. Oh, so I'll take that back then. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, we have submitted a, a list of uh, committee appointees for the number of our board trustee committees, which has been shared with all of our trustees at this point. And I hope um, this uh, set of committees uh, fits the skill sets and the interests of everyone. So just asking to acknowledge that that has been distributed. And looking at 12A, sorry, there isn't any motion required no, for that. As I understand it, yes. I would like to thank you, uh, Vice Chair Gillis, for your dedication to contacting and getting to know the trustees a bit better and uh, coming up with these excellent committee appointments. Thank you. Well, thank you for your assistance and your background knowledge that helped me understand what some of these <laughs> committee appointments. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and now you get the gavel. Now I get the gavel. Okay. <laughs> so I understand that as vice chair, I need to call for nominations for a board representative to the British Columbia Public School Employers Association, known as BCPC for 2023. And so I am calling for nominations. Yes. I would like to nominate Kat Eddy, please. Okay. Kat Eddy has been nominated. Is there a seconder for that? Thank you. We, okay. I don't believe we need second. Oh, thank okay. you. As I have explained to many people in the confidential meeting, I am learning. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Hagen. I appreciate your experience and wisdom. Are there any other nominations for this role as our board's representative for BCPC? Second time, for a third time, we therefore declare Trustee Eddie nominated and acclaimed as our representative and we continue to do a wonderful job and will you be um <clears throat> pointing we have trustee hagen as your alternate or is that yes if, if trustee hagen is uh comfortable with that appointment as the alternate on bcpc yes that's fine with me thank you <clears throat> thank you do i get to bang the if you want to go for it. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun, isn't it? All right, I just sent little chills. <laughs> and now I'd like to call for uh, nominations for the board's provincial council representative for the BC School Trustees Association for 2023. Are there any nominations? Trustee McMahon? I tried to nominate Cricket. <laughs> Thank you. And no seconder is required. <laughs> See how quickly I learned. Okay. Are there any further nominations? Um, so can I suggest that yes. um, uh, Chair Eddie take the, uh, yes. the, oh, the chair oh, for this as well? well. I guess <laughs> the gavel. Oh, I take the gavel. So be, oh, okay. okay. Sorry, that was the only time you get to hit the gavel. <laughs> yes. okay, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> and oh, yes. so, um, so Trustee Gillis has been nominated to the position of board representative for BCSTA for 2023. Are there any further nominations? And for a second time, are there for any further nominations? Seeing none, I'd like to um, pronounce, pronounce, acclaim <laughs> Gildas as our BCP or BCSTA rep for 2023. 
And as there is there an alternate? Yes, uh, Joyce McMahon. Joyce McMahon. Joyce, do you accept this nomination? I do. Thanks. And Joyce McMahon will serve as alternate. Yes. And that concludes the business of BCPC and BCSTA Provincial Council representatives. Thank you. So on to 12D, which is um, Trustee Hagen with Public Health Officer. Yes, uh, recently, I, sometimes I get to listen to the news at home <laughs> between shoveling manure uh, and the other duties that I have, but uh, it's come to my attention that the doctors in Ontario are now requiring that people wear masks. And it's not due to COVID. It's due to the uh, flu and the uh, influenza that's uh, going through the whole province, which has tied it down. And as well, uh, Ontario just recently uh, requires people now to wear masks again in certain areas, whereas before it was taken away. So my question is, is uh, uh, what the local uh, health officer, doc, um, what's her name again, Dr. Yes. yes. It, if we've approached her at all, and what what have we got for stats in the district? Now, recently, I hate to talk about my health, but I was sick with the flu for 10 days in bed. It really is devastating, and I don't know what our attendance rates are like right now, but I'm just wondering if some consideration had been given, been given as to what our next steps could be or couldn't be, and I don't have an opinion because I really don't like wearing masks, but just what, what are we doing just to make sure that we're ready for action should it be necessary and are we in contact with the necessary people? That's my question. I'm going to uh, I'm going to pass this to We are in, in uh, communication with public health, but at this time there is no indication that we're going to go back towards a mask mandate. Uh, I think public health will, if people are comfortable and they feel it necessary, uh, recommend people wear masks, but at this point it's an individual choice. Uh, as a system, we are monitoring both student and staff attendance. Uh, it's important to note that public health has access to our student attendance information. So VHA Island Health is able to determine absentee rates uh, province-wide or in, in Island House case island wide. So we don't have to report the information on a daily basis. They can access it straight through my BC or student information system. So what happens when we notice, we ask schools to let us know if there's a concern or high absenteeism uh, that puts us on alert. It triggers us for enhanced cleaning at those sites. If, if we're noticing a particular classroom, grade, school, uh, then our custodial department does enhanced cleaning. We have the equipment to do use a fogger, for example, uh, or spray based cleaning where, where you can disinfect quite quickly. For staff, we monitor uh, senior management gets a uh, at seven o'clock every morning. Our absentee staff absentee system sends the report of absenteeism among staff and the reason why they're absent and we from an operational standpoint we look at uh, whether or not we're in any danger of being short staff where we can't offer services we have plans in place from our covid time if x number of teachers aren't available what's our plan so we have those in place uh, it's important to note that because we've got some good prices, we do have a supply of masks. So to pivot, uh, it would not be difficult for our school if a mask mandate came in either for staff and or students. Uh, it wouldn't be like the last time where we're begging for a box at a time. We have a supply where we would be able to go for at least three or four months in a mask mandate. Follow up, Yeah, I didn't ask the question to alarm anyone. I just wanted to let people know that we're prepared mm -hmm. and that we're carefully listening and we have a plan in place. And thank you for your answer, Phil. Uh, I just want people to know that we don't need rumors, that we don't know what's going on, uh, that uh, that we're not prepared or that we have a budget set in place already or have purchased the masks. And that should something occur, we're ready. And that's all. It, I just wanted a reassurance of what we're doing, and I certainly would not want to cause 
any concern as far as, oh, you know, we're into a, a 15th wave of something, <laughs> but that we're actually ready, prepared, and uh, our senior management team is working hard towards that goal. So that's the only reason I have to ask the question. Thank you, Trustee Hagan. Is there any other comments on this matter? Seeing none, we're going to move forward into 13A and French immersion. Trustee Briggs. I would like to request an educational presentation to the board um, on the French Immersion Program to better familiarize us with the program. Personally, I don't know a heck of a lot about it, and I would like to. I would like to acknowledge Trustee Briggs that I, neither do I, know a ton about our French Immersion Program, and I'm quite looking forward to a, a report. Um, and I have forwarded that request to uh, Associate Superintendent Kyle. Although, okay, maybe, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Associate Superintendent Kyle, oh. who's watching right now? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm sure she is. <laughs> um, so, thank you, Trustee Briggs. Is there any further conversation? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, can we get a motion? Um, Absolutely. And uh, so, We'll take uh, Trustee Briggs as the first, and we'll look for a seconder. What was the motion? So, the, so the motion that staff prepare a report uh, to the board regarding the French immersion program. Presentation. I got Presentation. Presentation to the board regarding French immersion in School District 72. Um, that was moved by Trustee Briggs, seconded by Trustee Gillis. Is there any discussion? Is there a time frame? Is there a time frame? Okay. I had a parent ask me a question. I had already been thinking about this and then someone asked me about our French immersion program. Right. You can have any answer shortly. Any further discussion? All those in favor? The presentation has been formally requested. Thank you for bringing that forward, Trustee Briggs. Um, moving forward to business administration and the quarter, quarterly budget analysis, um, Secretary Treasurer Patrick. Yeah. So I would like to um, present the first quarterly budget uh, of this new year. Um, so this is the uh, budget report that goes from July 1st to September 30th, and it's a mixed bag because we have uh, one full month of school, which means teachers, educational assistants um, are in uh, are in session. Uh, but we also have a lot of work that gets done over summer. So uh, you'll see as we start to um, get into some of the details. But I just want to see if you can see that. Uh, it's looking much better than what I see on the screen. Um, so because when we do our budget um, and we do a budget year today, we're trying to project, but is it three out of 12 months or is it one out of 12 months? Um, and so what you're seeing right here is the uh, budget year to date uh, revenue. We were expecting 6 million, but we ended up getting 7 million, uh, almost just about eight. Uh, and why that is, is because the, um, the, the Ministry of Education um, realizes that most of our expenses do come in September, so they actually give us less grant. So rather than taking the grant and splitting it up evenly throughout the year, they give us less through the summer and then start to give us more in September and commit, and they do, deliver uh, to making us full by the end of the year. So you'll notice that the budget year to date is really represents one tenth of the Ministry of Education operating grant um, is, is what we had budgeted. But because we had some summer grants in there, we had received about $6 million. So, so it looks good. Um, we've received $7 million where we budgeted $6.3. Um, but again, that kind of through the year as we get more Ministry of Ed revenue, it starts to balance out and it usually is fairly, fairly close. Uh, on the expense side though, so this is the expenses for the entire district uh, on the operating side. Uh, for salaries and wages and benefits, you can see our year to date estimate is 7.2, and we're coming in at 7.3. Um, on the next page, I'll go a little bit more uh, in depth there. Um, but then on the services and supplies, you can see they were overspent by $600,000. So that is the work that gets done in the summer. 
Um, some other uh, items that happen is a lot of the licensing that we have to pay, we actually pay up front. So, so we don't go and split it up amongst the 12 months of the year either. Once it gets paid a $20,000 licensing fee, we book it. Um, so right now you can see that we are uh, technically showing we're $1.6 million overspent. Uh, I do expect that to even out a little bit because just a reminder, this budget, the board is fully balanced. So not drawing on any reserves. Um, and so it's a zero. So we do want to watch this very carefully. Um, and because at the end, we do expect there to be uh, the expenses to exactly match the revenue. So it might change a bit. And we uh, we do an update in uh, February. Um, so because a lot of this budget, it was based off of preliminary numbers and estimates that we had in spring of last year. Um, the final budget that we'll be looking at uh, and the first exposure a board will have to the final budget with the adjusted numbers is not until uh, it's not until March. So at the December uh, budget update will still be preliminary numbers from last year. So there always need to be a little bit of description and um, context to some of the items uh, that, that we share. Um, so then this next page here, can't quite get as much on, but I um, just yeah, point out a couple things. I just have a quick question while we were on this last one. Uh, now that they restructured the way that they hand the money out, we used to uh, collect quite a bit of money through interest in the bank. Yeah. Interest rates are really low right now, but uh, does this affect that as well? Or uh, so it does have an impact, um, but interest rates are actually rising uh, substantially, and we are uh, we're fortunate. Well, we have a good chunk of our funds on deposit with the province of BC, uh, and they adjust those rates as it changes. So mid month. If they uh, increase rates twice, we will actually see that increase twice in that month. So we're getting back up to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a month in, in interest income. So it's it's becoming more substantial. So staggering <laughs> the payments does have its impact for sure, um, uh, but it um, the result is we we still get a, a, a good income from investment income. Hey. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go through the detail there. Um, so this is a, another summary between the different sections, instruction, administration, operation, maintenance, and transportation. Uh, as you look further back in your report, you'll notice a greater detailed breakout of each of those. Uh, but I just wanted to point out a couple of uh, things on here. Um, so you notice under instruction uh, that we are spent 6.4 million and uh, the budget should be about 5.6. Uh, and a big reason for that is under our teaching, we currently are showing that expenses year to date are higher than what we had budgeted. So we have been looking into it. So this is just one month. So if that trend were to continue for the full year, of course, we would be substantially over. So. So we have been looking into it. Some of the explanations that I have is with it being the first month, staffing have been in September. They typically get, some of them get moved around a bit. People get placed. Uh, what this report isn't showing is as some of those uh, staffing have been put in place and if the staffing was coming from a budget that wasn't a staffing budget, let's say it was coming from a, a, a strategic priorities or a grant, that budget may not have been moved up to that line yet. So, so we're still waiting on it. Um, what we're looking for is, are there any concerns in there? Are there staffing that shouldn't be there? Uh, at this point, it doesn't look like there are. It looks like we're just identified various budgets that we'll need to move. So that's something that we'll be watching very, very closely. Uh, and at the next uh, budget update, we'll of course have an update on that. Um, so as you as you go down kind of 
uh, some of the seasonal use that um, that I mentioned um, before uh, it comes to little items like you can see that the supplies in the uh, transportation is is double. Um, but again, uh, a lot of that just comes from a lot of the work being done in the summer. Uh, so showing uh, highlighting the um, that's a pretty big number. It shows that we're overspent by seven hundred and eleven thousand um, dollars. But again, it's it's really early. We do expect that number as the season continues to narrow. Um, but we as staff are doing monthly reviews. Um, we did have a an inflationary surprise last year in February. Mm -hmm. uh, we we will, we're watching for those things as we go. So, um, so yeah, that's the, the update uh, from the significant things so far. That's okay. Great. Again, uh, where do we account for snow removal in this uh, transportation? So snow sure. removal will be under the supplies uh, in operations and maintenance. So nothing spent in this section here. Um, mm -hmm. There is a budget in there for that supply. It's supplies and services. If you go to the maintenance and operations page, you can see um, it would be under uh, Contracts. Versus supply, so it gets broken out in more detail. On that. Mm -hmm. So are there any other questions on uh, this? The, the December definitely starts to. To um, uh, to align with budgets and budget uh, year to date. So Kevin, just as a question, um, I see that some inflationary costs are being seen here. Um, what is the process? So we get to December into January, things don't start to level off. What's how do we how do we solve that problem? Because our reserves are desperately yes. low. Yeah. Uh, so what happens is uh, we have our 1701 update. Uh, we won't know what our final funded grants are until kind of December 15th. So it kind of Merry Christmas to us, um, but we start to put together the final budget in January. Um, so it's usually at that point where we'll be identifying some of those, like uh, those, the, the bigger, we may be working some of them earlier, uh, but when we get to February, there's potentially decisions. So historically, we've been able to draw on reserves uh, if total expenses exceed total revenues. But this year we'll have to bring it to the board and the board will have to decide if um, if the board would wish to draw a little bit on that surplus or whether we'd have to look at some mid-year cuts. So mid-year cuts are obviously a huge impact, um, uh, but the board is required to legally balance the budget and provide a balanced budget. I, I presume we're doing everything we can to save money now. Yes. It must come before uh, the senior management team, and there are perceived areas that we can make some uh, so and some reductions. When I and say that, I yes. mean not people, but reductions in the system. So we're actually we're not actively trying to save any further money. We have a balanced budget, uh, and our goals are to deliver the services that have been identified and supported by the board in that budget. Um, resources mean services to students. So, um, so based on the plans, we have adequate resources to support the plans that have already been approved by the board. Um, so we're not actively trying to save any more than that because we want to make sure we support students. The goal at the end of the year is to have zero money uh, within the annual budget left over. Um, but when we get to February, we may need to. So as we kind of start to see these costs creep up, if they aren't supported by increasing revenues, then we'll have to start identifying those. We likely won't make any changes, substantial changes, without talking to the board. Any further questions? 
Thank you for that update, Kevin, and, and not to be the bearer of bad news or to put any worry into the system. I'm I'm sure that finance, the last thing that we want to do is cut services, but I think that it is important to be aware that we are in a challenging budget year and that uh, our finance department is actively managing our budgets and preserving them on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So moving on to agenda item. I think we need a motion on that, do we not? Uh, not for the presentation. Okay. Unless, yeah. So moving on this to um, the next item, which is the finance warrant number four of October 31st, 2022. Oh, okay, that the finance warrant dated October 31st, 2022, accepted as presented, um, moved by Trustee Hagen, seconded by Trustee Briggs. All those in favor? So I can, no. if I can, uh, because we do have some new trustees here. So what this is, is this is something called a finance warrant. Uh, it actually is a big uh, a, an expansive bank reconciliation. Uh, we are one of only two school districts that still do this. This used to be a common um, document that would get presented and passed to boards around the province. We're one of only two that still do this. Um, and if you notice further back, we have vendor payments, we have uh, payments to employees, we have trustee expenses and the transparency. So we have kept it because of the transparency and accountability um, and the full circle best practice of good governance uh, that we we're being told to do or encouraged to do by the province actually is encouraging districts to get back to this type of thing. So our uh, document presentation is so old it's now new. <laughs> um, we've got there there being districts will be asked to present and share the same information in a different format. But um, so, you know, this is something we continue to do and we potentially can't change it. Um, but uh, yeah, we call it a finance warrant. It's really a bank reconciliation with additional information uh, that's of public interest. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Patrick. So the um, the motion is on the floor for vote. All those in favor of accepting the finance warrant of October 31st, uh, so passed. And thank you for your description, Kevin. Uh, so old, it's very new. I know the old and past. Committee reports um, 15A. Uh, so this is the report on the BCPC symposium and um, I attended the BCPC symposium on no November 7th and 8th with Secretary Treasurer Patrick, um, our head of HR, Andrea, and um, our HR, another HR staff member. Uh, it was it was a great symposium, um, some professional development the first time that the um, human resources field had been together in uh, over three years. Uh, there was some professional development around um, equitable, equitable hiring practices, um, Indigenous education through the lens of human resources. And of course, we did have an address from Minister Whiteside um, with not a lot of new information, just support for the field as we move forward, as well as, um, as, well as the contract um, updates regarding the BCTF provincial contract for teachers. Um, we also got some um, excellent news from PSEC, which is not official yet, but um, there is some positive news based on the advocacy <laughs> work that the previous board had done on exempt salaries and exempt staff raises. That's yes. all I can really say. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's public. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> And um, that's it for uh, my report for BCPC. So seeing no further business, um, we will um, ask for questions from anyone present um, in the forum, in the audience or online. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Are you, um, Deb Coons from the uh, CRBTA. I just have a couple of questions about some of the agenda meetings, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so the first question that I have is um, 
Will the um, uh, letter or list of the board members uh, that have been appointed to various committees in the district, will that be made public now that it's been approved? Because I noticed it wasn't in the agenda package. Yes, so it, it's, I, I believe that now that the, um, the committee report has been accepted, it will go out on the website. Yes, it will be it will be included in the board, um, the board news, and it will also be posted on the website. Great. Yeah. Um, another question that I have is um, regarding uh, the public health information. Um, that's also a concern that's come to me from teachers. There is a really from their perception, a large number of kids in, in classes that are absent today. Is there a particular threshold like do we know um, like it's great that the um, senior management team is monitoring the staff absenteeism on a daily basis. Do we know how often the public health officer might be pulling the information out of my ad and determining whether they need to give you some advice around enhanced cleaning and so forth? Because um, that certainly is, we seem to be in a wave right now that is uh, quite bad and yesterday the federal health officer declared uh, that we are truly in an epidemic of influenza. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if there's a threshold or. I'll have to find out sure. uh, to, to my understanding when it first started, it was daily okay. uh, that they were checking, but I I don't know if that's still the case. Okay. And the best um, process for like if a particular staff or an individual is concerned, Principal, principal will contact district staff. Is that still the best process? The, the principal will contact their associate superintendent and custodial. Okay, sure. Um, and another question, uh, the finance warrant, is that a monthly um, motion that comes? Like, do you do the finance warrant every month or is it, is it just happening like in October and May or? The, the finance warrant is done monthly and it's presented to the board of uh, quite close to the month end of which it pertains to. Okay. And I think that's all for now. Thanks, Deb. And there are, there are no questions that have come in online. Awesome. So seeing that, I would like to move to show. item 18. Oh, I just have one more question then. Uh, would it be appropriate then that we get a, uh, every time the board meets so we get an update on how they get uh, we're doing with our health uh, uh, officer in the district. Would that be appropriate, or what would you think would be a good idea, Phil? Uh, just given in COVID how how busy Charmaine Dr. Enns was, I, I don't know if I would be uh, able regularly, like in the three week intervals. Uh, I, I can update where we are in the district if there's any concerns in that, but I, I wouldn't want to tie the update to feedback from the public health officer uh, because there's various branches. And, and so I, Dr. Enns, she, she's been so giving of her time and accessible and all that sort of stuff, uh, but, but I would be hesitant to ask her just for where we are right now. Bill, I, I want you to know how well you've done our district in the past through COVID and the, all the work that you've done. Uh, I'm just conscious that I'm hearing from a lot of parents, and so I'm not asking or even trying to tell you how how to do things, but whatever you can think of that would help you assure people that we're on track and we're doing the, uh, in all that we can. And I don't believe that there is something to be uh, nervous about right now. I was just asking to say, it seems to be an issue and what are we doing and I just how can we make sure that we're, we're ready for whatever could happen and it probably won't even happen. So that's all I'm asking. And I can definitely do an update and hopefully the update is, you know what, it's getting better. And, and but yeah, definitely each board meeting I can do an update, a public update. And as the agenda setting committee, Daryl will take that to note and we'll add that into the public agenda for next meeting. Good. And so um, moving forward to item 18, a motion for adjournment. <laughs> Trustee Hagen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.